Hey everyone, welcome back to Owner Occupied. We are here with episode 13. As usual, I'm super excited to bring this episode to you. Uh, Russell and I really get into it on hiring and interviewing. Uh, so we we have a really extensive discussion and and bring bring out our best ideas and concepts and and kick around some really interesting questions around how to hire the right people, how to find the right people, what are some tips during the interview process. Uh, we discuss what how can you know if it's time to hire somebody or if you just need to look to improving systems and operations already within your business. Uh, we discuss, I'm hiring right now for a, a high level role. So we, we kind of talk about that a little bit. I share some of my experiences interviewing higher level folks and, and where we are there. And then uh, we wrap up also with some great ideas around how you can gauge employee loading. Uh, Russell has some really uh, unique ideas around how you can get a sense for what your team is up to and, and whether they're busy or not. Uh, and, and really put some, put some new light on that in a way I hadn't thought of before. So Let's dive right into it. I can't wait to bring this episode. Here we go. Hello, Peter. How's it going? Hey, uh, it's going well, Russell. How are you today? I'm doing well. You have a little vacation coming up or time with your family. Is that is that right? Yeah. So my sister's coming into town t- tonight with uh, with her son, who's about my daughter's age, and they they're like best friends. They're so cute together. Uh, so they're spending a few days with us and I'll be taking a little bit of time off work to, to spend time with them. And yeah, it should be really nice. I think, uh, I think the time off question, uh, dovetails nicely with our, our topic today. And that's, that's hiring. You've, you've mentioned before, and I think it's true for most of us that, that employee expenses are grossly disproportionate share of our expenses. Um, you've also written about low code, no code tools you can do to take care of automated tasks yeah. and you're in the middle of a big hiring. So it's a good time to talk yeah. about sort of your decision-making process on that. I'm curious, uh, when do you, how do you make that decision to hire someone versus to try and patch together a, a different solution uh, that uh, that's far less expensive? Yeah. Well, as you know, I'm a big proponent of uh, using software and automation to speed up or, or gain efficiency in, in small business. Um, and there, it is sometimes difficult to determine if if you're noticing that your your team is sort of at capacity or nearing capacity, and by that I mean everyone is busy all day, every day. Um, just as a side note, I mean, I, I like to run for property management. I like to see our team running around 80 to 85% loaded on average, which means in theory, if they get in, you know, at 9 a.m., they should be wrapping up most of their important tasks with about an hour to spare, half an hour to spare at the end of the day. So they have some slack if there's urgent items or or something comes up or we onboard a, a new property or something like that. So um, when I notice that we're nearing the limits and it, it's feeling like everyone is having a hard time staying caught up, I do have to sort of confront this decision, which is, is everyone at the company, first of all, are they performing well? Meaning, am I getting the most out of my employees that I can in terms of productivity and performance? And, you know, that's probably like a separate discussion and I'm I'm still learning a lot about that. I think I have a long way to go. Uh, but is, assuming that's true, is it now time then to hire somebody or is it possible we could go in and look at how everyone is doing their work and and gain some efficiencies? So in the past, I've, I, tr- I, it was easier when we were smaller because I was much more connected to what everyone was doing. And I had quite recently been doing all that work myself. So I had an, an intuitive feel for how long things should be taking, how many properties and units we could be managing, um, given a certain number of team members, but that's getting harder now. And so I do find myself grappling with that question, like, man, it seems like everyone's really busy, but I don't know if it's time to hire or do I really just need to dig into some of the systems and processes and, and maybe there's some bottlenecks there or things could be updated. So I don't think there's any like 
quick and easy answer there. I think it, it's probably some combination of talking to your team and, and your managers and asking, kind of digging in on what's consuming everybody's time. I have found that, that employees are notoriously unable to articulate what is consuming their time. And I don't know why that is exactly. But if you're just to ask one of my employees, like, so could you just give me like, what is actually taking up most of your time during the day? Because it seems like you're really busy. And they'll just kind of rattle off. You know, they don't seem to be very thoughtful about that or or able to sort of clearly summarize disparate tasks in maybe a few chunks. Like, well, it's actually the new client tasks and everything that's associated with that that's been consuming a lot of my time recently. So, you know, I don't know if the answer is some sort of a time tracking app on their computer or... Maybe someone needs to be checking in with them every hour and like, hey, what are you working on right now? Um, yeah, so I don't I don't know what the answer is. It's a little bit of intuition, a little bit of investigation and talking to your current team. And you also have to stay abreast of what's possible within your industry in terms of efficiency and automation because new tools are coming out all the time and your current tools are being updated and upgraded. And I have found that it's been, it's paid off for me to keep up with that stuff. And when there's like a new release notes for Airtable, I'll go in and read those and figure out. And I have found different times when I've been like, oh man, this is great. I can now plug this into this other tool that we're using and that eliminates a whole handoff that we were doing manually, Mm -hmm. stuff like that. So yeah, I think the short answer is it's it's a hard question and it's difficult. Um, And I don't know that I know how to give like, I'm not even 100% confident in our own company, you know, when we make those decisions. So it's tough. What, how do you think about that? I I don't think about it systematically. I think about it as human beings and individuals. And so um, I tend to hire what I think are all-star performers. Somebody does something extraordinary that if I deliver that for a client, there's a there's a high impact for the client in that. And so I tend to be um, more more sporadic in that uh, once I've hired that person, there's two I evaluate there's two things I can't deal with. I can't um, deal with stupid and I can't deal with lazy. Um, <laughs> stupid I can't fix and Tell lazy you really I don't think. have the patience for. <laughs> and so, but other than those two things, if I've made the decision to hire them, and I know some business experts think differently, move on, that sort of stuff, but um, they've got something and I've made a commitment to them. And so then I just figure out how to add value to what they're doing. And so I'm getting, I always get the thing I hired for them for. And then I'm now I'm just trying to add how is, how else can I add value to what you're doing in the day? Yeah. And then, and then for my business and I'm, this is where I'm, I'm looking and some, some consultants going to hear this uh, and call me and, and rescue me. But um, for a lot of the creative and talent work that I have, so I'll sign a new client and it is all hands on deck for a month as we develop new strategies, material, uh, figure out how to win for this client in a new way. And it's, it's disruptive to everybody's schedule. It's abusive. But once that material is created and placed, everybody gets that time back on their, yeah. on their call, except my phone yeah. rings on the way home and we've got another one or we've got an, another potential one and the same people writing a proposal are doing work on existing clients. And, and so everybody's day is structured different. And so I have some folks on the team who, who thrive in that environment and some who would be listening to this podcast and say the world would be a better place if, Peter Lohman were running this company instead of (laughs) Russell Chaos. I don't know about that. I think one key distinction between your business and mine is that I think your business is project based. You you get a new client, you have a project for them. uh, It kicks off, it's intense. And then your, your project sort of has a natural slope where it evens off and you've put everything in, you put everything in place and, and everything's kind of running for them. 
whereas property management is not project based, um, it's very much it's reactive. So a tenant calls in with an issue, you have to deal with that. A tenant pays rent late, you have to deal with that. And so what it's very predictable, right? So everything that you do in property management is extremely predictable. You know a certain percentage of tenants are going to pay late. You know you're going to onboard a certain percentage of new clients every month. And so you can create very repeatable systems and processes to deal with that. And it helps smooth out the workload, which is nice. Um you know, there's there's advantages and disadvantages of both, but I think they probably require very different approaches in terms of deciding when it's time to hire, um, and 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 even the types of people that you would be looking for. So, well, I'm I'm curious in this latest hire that you're doing. It's a significant hire, someone yeah. with a lot of responsibility, an expensive hire, not not one of those two threes and fours that we've yeah. talked about. Um, but more of a leadership role touching everything you do. Uh, so is this a hire that's taking work that you're currently doing and giving it to someone else? Is it taking work off of your, off of your existing team? How do you, how's, how's that yeah. looking? <clears throat> so the, the position is director of maintenance operations and it's, it's essentially work that my business partner was doing. So my business partner and I are supposed to close on and buy this engineering firm this week, and he's going to go off and run that. We're 50-50 owners, both in that new business and this existing business. So he's actually been out of the day-to-day -day here at the management company for a couple weeks now, and his activities and duties have fallen on me. So I need this person to come in and take those duties back off of me. <clears throat> and the role is really over all the maintenance operations and activity at the company. We've got six W-2 maintenance employees that this person will be managing. We have a vacant turn coordinator position, Ian, uh, that this person will be managing. And they'll be dealing with the client questions having to do with uh, the properties. So everything having to do with the physical structures of the units and the properties that we manage will be this person's responsibility. The buck's going to with, stop with them to make sure that the properties are being well maintained, the units are getting turned over, the clients are happy, the guys, uh, the maintenance guys are, are staying busy and, and are happy hiring and firing them. So yeah, it's, it's a parallel to our, we have a director of property management position and the three of us, that director of property management, the new hire and myself, uh, that's the leadership team or will be the leadership team at the company responsible for setting the strategy, the direction, the culture, uh, leading the team, you know, through the EOS model, that'll be the group that's in the level 10 meetings and the quarterly offsites and all that. So it's absolutely critical that we get someone who's, who's hungry, smart, um, knows how to talk to and manage blue collar employees, but can also deal with, uh, the, the property owners, the clients. So it's, it's a very difficult hire in my opinion. And, and we've been looking for a while. We've done some interviews. Uh, we had a couple people that we liked pretty well, but we couldn't, see eye to eye on salary. That may mean we're too low. I don't know. I'm still exploring the marketplace there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a big one for me. It's, you know, and, and due to the nature of the two roles, this role is, is actually going to be higher paid than our director of property management because it's, it's actually a harder type of role with more responsibilities in my opinion. Um, so it's by far the highest salary that we've, or that we will have ever paid so yeah, and it reminds me, I mean, you, you brought on a partner who was, who was high paid and I don't think it's quite an equal uh, parallel to that example, but it's kind of similar in scope that it was the, the, a big jump in mindset and, you know, the, and I've mentioned a couple of times, you know, we need, I need a brain, not hands. We've got hands. I need another brain who can, who can think and plan and problem solve with me. So, and so when I read that job description, you know exactly the task that they're doing uh, and that you want done. You've got a good vision for it. Um, so when you're interviewing someone, how do you, you're interviewing someone that's ticking the boxes as you go through, you've met some people who were price ranged out. Um, how are you approaching that process uh, so that, you got a culture fit, you got a job description fit. Um, 
do you have growth in mind for that person or that role at all? It's not reflected. When I look at it, it, it didn't seem reflected in that, that the boundaries were really clear. You knew what that person was going to be doing and you know what you're going to, you're looking for. Yeah. I, I think that's a fair summary. Um, when, when we're checking off the boxes during the hiring process, there's a few things I'm looking at. One is they need to have the right experience. You know, they've got to have experience with, with residential structures um, because there's just a lot of ins and outs of household systems that they need to be intimately familiar with. They don't need to be an expert, but they need to be very familiar and able to speak the language uh, both so they can talk to the guys and have their respect, but, and, and likewise with the clients um, you know, they need to have fantastic communication skills. Uh, they need to, um, just have a certain sort of gravitas, I guess, in, in, in a leadership role. Uh, again, you're managing uh, a group of hardworking guys who are going out in the heat and the dirt and the nasty smells and dealing with people. And when they come into the office for a one-on-one, they need to be looking in the in the eyes of someone that they can respect and and feel like has their back, knows what they're going through, and maybe even been there, done that. Um, and we're also, you know, per the EOS model, we're looking for someone who uh, who who gets it, wants it, and has the capacity to do it. I think that's GWC is though is what they use there. Uh, and we're also kind of scoring them against our our core values to make sure that we feel like this person is going to be additive to the culture and and exhibiting the the uh, the qualities that we look for in someone who's successful in this line of work. So, you know, and then of course, you know, you could spend. I just read like a. I think you and I were tweeting a little bit about this, like ten page blog post deep dive on hiring. You know, there's all these personality tests you can do, and you know, you could obviously there's people who. It's their whole career is hiring people. Um, and in terms of the role, you know, there's there's a huge opportunity with this role because maintenance, the maintenance work that we do, it's actually a profit center for us. It's a small profit, but it is profitable. And so the more guys we add and the more work we can bring in-house, that's just more revenue for our business. So the right person in this role can come in And the sky's the limit in terms of what they could do and grow. You know, I can provide the infrastructure and the back end. If they've got the willpower and the know-how, you know, they can go out and start, you know, per our discussion with John Wilson, they could go buy a truck and outfit it for HVAC. They could go buy a truck, outfit it for plumbing, get the right guy in there with the right licenses, bring them in-house and start billing out that work to our customers who own the properties and even maybe going out into the public and offering that service up. We already do this wood window restoration and small concrete work for the public. That could be ramped up and dramatically expanded. There could be a whole marketing campaign around that. So, you know, this person could really take and run and turn this division into a multi-million dollar business on its own and and be appropriately compensated uh, as such. So uh, although the role does have some sort of minimums, there's also a huge opportunity in a way that's actually not true for some of the other roles at our company. That's a... That's the part that I was looking at and saying, uh, because by dent, my disposition, I'm looking at someone and I do it from the first hire, uh, from everyone in the organization. I know, I know what they like to do, what they don't like to do and where they want to go. And uh, for we're at, you know, we're at 11, 12, 12 people now and uh, and I know that for each of those, I'm thinking about how to help them get to where it is they want to be. Yep. And I'm learning all the time. <laughs> this person hates this situation, this person, <laughs> you know, this sort of thing and, and yeah. thinking, but I need you to do it or I don't need to, I'm thinking about that constantly. Um, but I start with where do they want to go? And for this hire, when I think about it, um, you can terrify people. I listen to small business guys talk about incentive structures and, and you can terrify someone with here. You could work into an ownership structure of the, they don't want that. They want, uh, they, they want to know they're not going to get fired. 
<laughs> they want mm-hmm. they want a pay. They want to. Um, I have I have a great uh, I have a great person on the team, and and they're responsive and wonderful. Uh, but they really really want their job to end at five o'clock, and they don't mean that it's not because they're lazy um, or unresponsive, but in their world. Um, they give me everything from seven in the morning. They take their break <laughs> and, yep. and five o'clock. Um, and if I send an email, uh, they're going to respond to it, but they hate it. Like, and it's, it's, and so anyway, so when I do that thinking and I think about it in terms of your hire, you've almost got two kinds of people you could get a maintenance person who could kill it on delivering uh and bonding with your team and delivering all of the maintenance services for your existing properties and they're comfortable in that role um but they they're not entrepreneurial in that they would never envision themselves running an hvac company because i know everything there is to know about this property management yeah maintenance stuff that's on my plate and to go outside my comfort zone to learn a new line of business would scare me away. Um, Whereas someone else might say, I could run that and I've got this huge opportunity with the right structure and investment where I could build out a plumbing division and make (laughs) <laughs> make uh, and make multiples of what I'm making on my day one job. That's almost, it seems like you'd attract two totally different people depending on how you advertised or marketed or what you pitch. Like That's right. Yeah. And, and we are kind of inadver- inadvertently doing that. We're getting okay. two very different types of people who are interested in a position. Um, and it's, yeah, I have found that the even the entrepreneurial types that we've talked to, and these are some of the guys that were asking for the higher salary, um, they even were not very because I had proposed to a couple of them like, "Hey, what you know, X Y Z for the base, and then maybe we'll give you like five percent or eight percent of the additional revenue that comes in as a result of you growing this division." And they were not super, you know, they didn't seem very interested in that. They were much more concerned with the base salary and the paid days off. And, and I think it was a reminder for me. And I think it's easy as an entrepreneur, you start to think that everyone thinks like you, um, but they really don't. Uh, Most people, they want job security. Like you were saying, they want to know they're going to have a job. They want to get that paycheck on Fridays and there's nothing wrong with that. Right. I mean, that's, we need folks we need those people who are going to be our employees, right? Not everyone can be an entrepreneur. So um, I'm trying to sort of put myself back in that mindset a little bit, back to when I was an engineer employee and think about what I was valuing and how I was sizing up a prospective employer and what I was negotiating for during the... Because the other thing you got to remember is that employers promise everything to prospective employees, right? When they're courting somebody... I think we've all had an employer, oh, you can be promoted. We're going to, your company's growing, blah, blah, blah. They make all these promises and then, you know, it never happens. So employees who have been burned by that in the past are not likely to very, to, to take you at your word on, hey, you could take and run and grow this division. And they're already envisioning the worst case scenario where that budget evaporates because you have a bad year and you have a bunch of excuses as to why they they can't do that. And now they're stuck with this kind of low base salary. So I get it. Um, I get it. I just, it's tough, right? Because there's part of me, I think almost the easy route would be that first type of person. Just bring someone in who knows enough, maybe an old maintenance person who's done that before. Like you said, it'd be easy for them. Uh, But that person would, you know, they would be okay. They would be fine. But I, I, I just... I think we need to get someone in there who's going to be very dynamic and and think big and and someone that's really going to help energize and motivate me because um, this person is going to be very much in it with me in terms of running the business. So, is your salesperson integrated into your salesperson's essentially focused on adding new units? Correct. Um, are they are is that salesperson integrated in this in the gro- invested in the growth of this other division possibly or this other maintenance operation no they're not 
Um, and is that, uh, is that permanent or, well, maybe, maybe I'll start mechanic mechanically who's involved in the interview process for this person. Uh, myself, my business partner and our director of property management. Yeah, the sales guy is really kind of a lone wolf. He's on his own running around trying to drum up new business for for properties to manage. The the I'm hiring a a sales guy. I had a sales and but I'm I said sales guy and that really is what I think he, this person's going to be. Um but for the for the print business that I bought and mm -hmm. and he he sort of had a disdain for marketing that I found very attractive in a salesperson. He's like, yeah, you can do whatever you want, but I got to call. I got to call people. and I got to meet with people. And, <laughs> and <Good. laughs> yeah, it was not it was not it was not attractive to him when I talked about the digital marketing that we're going to do and the yeah. verticals. And I he was interested that I could introduce him to people, but he was. Like I'm going to be out and doing things. If I hit these numbers, I'm going to get paid. Um, and, and for what I need, at least initially, um, that is certainly the case. Um, yeah. But uh, one, one thing, and I should mention this, it might be helpful to you for, for my experience, but I've interviewed hundreds of people. I have hired dozens and dozens through the through the years in in both uh, private and civil service. Uh, I'm a big believer in the in the in the panel uh, of a in an interview panel. Um, a a series of questions in addition to the conversation, um, and and. And for me, not talking, <laughs> and um, and and even when you mention that you've got the leadership on on uh, you've got the leadership involved in that interview process. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to do it, you might think about including someone on your team who could grow or develop. Um, maybe somebody that's on the maintenance team um in the idea that you're not gonna see the whole picture you're gonna you're you're gonna see things that you like and reflect um and other people are going to see things and usually it's a reflection of yourself we're all very yeah. self-interested <laughs> and yeah. so, so we read ourselves into their situation That's when you right. talk i think how i would handle it when i but putting in a panel where other people are talking and you're forced to listen to those other reflections can be very helpful. And I still always make the decision, but having that decision informed by uh, an admin person who notices something else or a maintenance guy who notices something else. And for me, the sales guy who might think of a way where this person can help them make money. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. or think of an idea. Um, but they also learn about other parts of the business. And because this person is so central, is going to be part of the leadership and the culture and values, you're also transmitting to the other people who are involved in that interview process, what your culture and values are and why right. you're thinking yeah. of this. And even and what we do, what I would do after the initial interview, when the interview's over, that time where everybody says what they like, maybe for the standard questions, why they gave them a five or a four or a three on those questions. Wait a minute. I gave that person a 22 and you gave them a, a 17, which where'd we disagree? Yeah. Those are really valuable for the team. So you could be extracting value from each of these interviews. Um, and then, That's a good point. Yeah. And then even before I get to the conclusion stage or the offer stage or that negotiation, I might have a, if I interview seven people, I might understand what the trade-offs are. Wait a minute. These are, these are three high quality people. This, my team was excited about working with this person. I love this person. I would but you that now understand what the trade-offs are. If I go with this route, I'm getting less of this. 
um, if I go this route, I'm getting less of this, but this excites these people more. And having that complete picture lets you know where there might be gaps in that new hire where you're going to, you're going to improve them in this area, or you're going to, you're going to set an indicator or a measurement on some skill where they're, you know, that they're weak. So you're going to focus on that as a growth tool right from the start yeah. or you talk to them about it early. Just some, just some, some thoughts on, yeah. uh, on how to, how to arrive at a decision as opposed to it thinking, dun, 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 I found the one, uh, <laughs> and there isn't a, the one maybe, yeah. um, but you've you've already arrived at the point where you'd have been comfortable with a couple of these already, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, we had some offers out and some hard discussions about salary and just couldn't get there. Um, yeah, it's, you know, one of the guys I think was, he was right about the right type of personality and experience level, but he was just commanding you know, he had somehow worked himself up to a super high salary at his previous job. And it just wasn't within the realm of reason for us. Another one of the guys was probably a little bit overqualified for our size of operation. He had kind of done something really similar on a much bigger scale already. So again, he was, you know, commanding a higher salary and and probably rightfully so, but again, we just couldn't, couldn't get there. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Um, I'm always open to being wrong. So if it turns out that, Hey, I'm just expecting too much for an XYZ salary, then that you know, we're going to have to get comfortable with that. I just don't know that I'm quite there yet. So we'll see. That's, that's a, it's, it's good self-awareness as you, as you think about that. Um, how did you, how did you set the salary? What was the process of setting what you thought the salary range should be? Kind of a guess, just, knowing what our other team members make and then knowing, you know, obviously I'm, I'm in, I know what I make as the owner and I know what our sales guy makes and I know what our director of property management makes. And I know what, you know, sort of on the other end of the spectrum, I know what like a, a licensed engineer could make, you know, uh, I always kind of use that as like a, as a base just cause that's what my degree is in. And I was started out as an engineer. So you know, you think about someone who's a sort of a mid-level manager uh, at a larger company or or a on the leadership team at a smaller company, kind of middle of their career type person, uh, management experience, you know, but they're also not running a Fortune 500 company. So I don't know. It's, it's a guess. You see what you get, right? You know, if you're getting if no one's interested and no one's applying or everyone you talk to is like, Hey, like you're joking about the salary range, right? You know, obviously, you know, you're too low. Um, and it's, it's kind of like setting the rent for a house, right? You just, the market is, the market sets the price. You don't set the price. The market sets the price and you're just in the process of discovering what the market price is for that role. So of course you start maybe a little low, um, because you don't want to overpay, right? But, you know, you don't want to waste too much time either. There's a trade-off between, hey, this guy wants $5,000 more than I'm really comfortable with, but he can start Monday, you know, and this problem can be solved. Yeah, it's interesting. I have a I have a situation now for a hire um, in my consulting business where I'm, I'm, I'm torn because for low-level... Uh, writing experience and work. I know what I can, I know what I can get from a subcontractor. And I know that for a little bit more, I could get an entry level person. Um, and the work might not be as good, but I'd get a lot more of it. And so I can do that. Um, or I can just pay more and get high quality, higher volume. Um, and be and and really set that that function but for me that for me that that difference in hire is maybe a a 28 to thirty five thousand dollar entry level Spread. type yeah. person and and i could go a long way with that or a sixty thousand dollar person who um 
And really that's for me and my, and my hiring process, that's not a mid-level person in that um, somebody that's on a growth tra trajectory likely is not going to join my firm. If they're making a rent and they're interested in that 60, they're looking at firms that are paying 80, 90 yeah. with a growth trajectory. And so I'm really looking at a, at a late stage, someone who, someone who, um, who maybe is not planning on being a, a six figure performer. They're just, they're looking for some security and, and to do their thing and not be pressured or stressed. So those are three really different approaches to it. And, and frankly, I'm in the paralysis stage where <laughs> I can just, I can endure another really unpleasant month from a work life balance and crank it out and get it done and spend some on, on non-permanent solutions yeah. uh, and, and punt on that until I find the right one. But uh, I'm kind of in the same boat. It's uh, you know, it's you're, there's a trade off between you can always find someone to do it cheaper. Right. But there's a value of your own time in managing that person and checking right. their work and training them. Right. So that you can't discount that either. Um, you bring someone in who's very well qualified, very smart. You pay them a little bit more, but man, the value is high because now you're freed up to go and work on other even higher value tasks. So it's, yeah, you know, but you also can't burden your business with a huge cost structure in terms of salaries. Right. I mean, right at the end of the day, we're still small businesses and, and, uh, we got to make payroll. So yeah, tough decisions. And I feel like it's not getting any easier. <laughs> I'd say that's but. the hardest part of, of being a small business. I'm, uh, I'm, I tend to be a more conservative person in my career. I've, I, I worked in government and represented companies and corporations. And I, uh, and I always had a disposition to help small business. I'm, I, uh, and I enjoyed it. Um, but I find it as a small business person and my passion is magnified multiples. And when I think about everything that I put at risk, um, and the thing that keeps me up at night is the responsibility. One of my customers, they're paying me, they're paying me money to deliver a product. Um, and then my, and my employees who yeah. had other options and I pulled them from that other thing and said, this is going to be good for you. <laughs> yeah. Take this money to deliver this service. And I've got to pay that obligation, uh, every month in that commitment. And if it goes spectacularly well, I will, I will earn money. Um, which the government will take half of. <laughs> and if it goes poorly, um, if it goes poorly, uh, the government's not going to share in any of the downside. <laughs> right. And may still come after me for <laughs> for expenses and fees uh, and taxes. Well, you can carry forward losses, I think, for a few years. But yeah, I get your yeah. point. Yeah, theoretically, uh, things can things can work out, and a tax person can do do some things. But it's ugly. It's uh, yeah. it's ugly for uh, it's ugly for a while. But even those lost car carry forwards, they're still getting money. For, <laughs> it's money. It's my money. Right. They're just yeah. timing wise on when they're going to take it and how the percentage of how much they're going to make. For some of the clients that I deal with, some of the some of the service based businesses and that sort of thing. Um, contractors, the government's making more on their business than they are from wow. that percentage basis on the margin that they get after everything is done. Um, yeah. That's a, that's an aside. So, but the the process of of narrowing in on this employee, when you think about it, um, there's two pieces. It's taking work off of your plate and freeing you up to do other things. Those seem like, for me anyway, those seem like I understand those better. I understand how that's going to make a meaningful difference in my business. Um, it can be less so when you're talking about taking work off of your employee's plate that 
you described at the beginning of our conversation running at about 80 to 85 percent so that at the end of the day if they had about an hour or half hour you knew that um how do you i mean you have to track that at least mentally you've got a picture of what you think it is by talking to your employees watching listening um is that is that what you how do you arrive at that number uh what's your process look like um the process is not good it needs to be a lot better um ideally there would be some sort of an employee check-in system where at the end of every day they would kind of rate their loading for that day and as i'm talking through this i'm in, i'm actually coming up with some ideas about how we could do that right in slack um i'm sure there's uh like a little bot i could program that would you know it would ping every employee, all the office employees at the end of the day and say, Hey, on a scale of one to 10, how busy were you today? Or how much free time did you have or something? And then it could assemble those and average them every week and, and, and kind of report back on who was, who was the most heavily loaded and things like that. But as it is today, it's just talking and it's a kind of a feel and a sense for how stressed everyone is and how responsive they are to emails and um, how quickly things are getting done. Part of why I don't like being remote, and we've got several multiple employees who are remote right now, is I lose a lot of that intuition about how busy they are. I can't see their face. I can't hear them on the phone. I can't see them scurrying around the office. Um, it's not that I really care if they're watching a YouTube video in the middle of the workday. I really don't as long as the work's getting done. But if I can't know how busy they are, I don't know whether I should be preparing to hire somebody or giving them a bunch of work that I'm currently doing. Or So, yeah. The, or a new office, you know, we closed on our new office on Friday, uh, 6,700 square foot office warehouse flex space. We're moving in about uh, four weeks into that space and we're going to bring everyone back who's currently remote. And I, I couldn't be more excited for that. So that's going to be a, that's going to be a big, big deal. And as you approach and, and that 500 unit range, a new space, uh, a, a new key hire, it can be. It yeah. can be a good time to implement maybe some new new system yep. for for doing that. You you have some key pieces in your in your work that you know somebody wants to rent a unit. You can't. Hey, I'll get back to you in three days. Like <laughs> right. you know, there's some pieces that can't slip, and then there's others that if you don't get to, That's uh, right. it's okay. Not just on your plate, but on your on your team member plate. So you can measure the stuff we can't drop it's harder i suspect to measure the stuff that um that if it slips it we could have gotten to it if they didn't watch that youtube video but we'll never know right that's right yeah and then uh how i think about it i'm curious how you i fill up the i think about filling up the the time with um if you're not busy delivering uh, product for clients, you, I have a, a marketing and sales plan and I start plugging their various talents in the different marketing activities, which theoretically there's some pieces that won't stop, but I've sort of got those moving already. So yeah. any of that other stuff is, is extra. Like it, it's not the end of the world if it doesn't happen, but I've got you I've got something you could be doing so that That's right. you're not sitting around doing nothing. Um, do you, do you have those kind of filler activities for your, for your folks um, where you can see if some of that stuff's getting done? You know, that's a great point. I don't think we have a good setup right now for that. And you're kind of getting my brain moving a little bit on this. I think you're right. I think, we could probably easily come up with a list of a, a half a dozen or a dozen types of activities that if they did get to 4 p.m. and they literally ran out of stuff to do, they could work on. And that would be a great way to gauge, you know, how busy everyone was. I'm sure there's stuff I could come up with, you know, whether it's in operations or, or marketing or sales or um yeah, there's definitely I usually, opportunities. I usually develop that list based on on marketing ideas that I have, or it'd be nice to have that I know yep. I'm never going to get to. Yeah, and exactly. that uh, that it'd be 
it'd be nice to send an email uh, uh, that that I'm probably not going to get to on to a to a prospect um, or somebody got a mention or set a Google alert for my top five prospect names. And so that I get an email if they're mentioned in the news. And Mm -hmm. so uh, that sort of thing, so that a lot of that can come to nothing. But if I'm, if I'm, I do it when I'm fried, when I just can't think anymore, I go to that little to-do list and I, Hey, congratulations on your, on your award. I know that's not, and I get that out. Um, I want them to know I'm thinking about them and I, and that it's not, I can get so project focused or, or whatever that I have to program some of those other touches in there. That's how, I mean, just little things. That's great. Yeah. You can say, Hey, that'd be great, but life's busy. Projects are busy. (laughs) Your, your, your other stuff's going on, but you could also, I think if you, if you judged and said, I I've set in the, the getting reviews has not been a priority for the, for the, uh, for the print business that I just bought. So I'm, I'm in the parking lot of, of the company and I Google print near me and we're on the third page as I'm Mm. in the, (laughs) in the parking lot. Um, it's, uh, and so, just talking to the customer service reps, they have a lot of downtime when they have to be there, but there's downtime in between when the orders come in. And so just thinking about uh, how do I teach them marketing? Can I have them watch a video? Can I, yeah. can I show them the importance of reviews or have them Google some of our competitors and, 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 if I think that our service is the best and that our price is competitive and that it's a good thing for customers to come here, it's good for their business. I want them to come here because it's good for them that I need to make it easy for them to find me. And so the setting a goal to get to a hundred five-star reviews yeah. isn't so that I can make more money or just to fill up your day, but it's so that we can help more businesses get to where they need to go. Those little conversations with, um, with a CSR um, who's, who can touches every single customer that's in and out, everybody touches the CSR and, and they've got great personalities and they're, and they know when the customer is thrilled and happy and has a big smile on their face um, versus somebody who's in and out. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Pays the bill yeah. and is out. Right. Maybe one of those gets a text message to, can yeah. I get a review? <laughs> Definitely. And the other one um, gets a note from, to the met to me or, or the manager to call and say, uh, you know, I, you know, did it go all right? What can we do? You know, um, can we make it better next time? That Those sorts of things. Anyway, those, but you can also, if you have that mechanist task um, that somebody's going to send an email out, how many emails did you send? And so if somebody's sending 10 emails and someone's never sending any emails, that's an end of the day. If you don't have anything else, do right. this, you've sort of filled in their day and it could be a gauge for, and you don't care if that it's not an essential activity. You then have a gauge for yeah, this person exactly. is being really efficient with their time. Right. Um, or, or somebody swamped that maybe I can help them or engage with them in a different way to find out what's going on there. Yeah. Well, this has been great. I think we covered a broad uh, array of topics on hiring and interviewing here and, and um, engaging employee loading. I've got some great ideas I know for myself. Uh, it's funny. I know it's, it, I do some of my best thinking while I'm talking. It's actually kind of frustrating because I'll be thinking about a problem for days. And then all I have to do is have a five minute conversation with the right person. And a bunch of answers come flowing right out of my own mouth. Uh, it's fascinating, but, um, many last points here before we wrap up. No, I don't know. Uh, I'm getting a lot of value out of these. I actually listen to it afterwards just to get, through the pain of listening to my own voice and <laughs> yeah, all my uh, inconsistencies that everybody has, but I've got my own. Um, but I've been taking notes and I'm shocked. Um, I'm shocked when I go back how much I learn when I re-listen 
to it. I'm, yeah. I'm engaged in our conversation. I feel like I learn, I take notes during our, during our talk. Um, but I learn a lot when I go back and listen to it. Yeah. Um, I have no idea who else is listening or, or what value they're getting out of it. Um, but I know yeah. we're doing it for the right reason. I hope, uh, I hope other people are, and I just want people to know if, if something I've said, um, if you think you can be helpful to me, I'm really open to learning. Uh, I do take lots of advice. I, it may be one of my superpowers is that uh, <laughs> I listen and take advice. I take lots of advice. Um, yeah, your superpower so is taking advice. Feel free to reach out yeah. to me if I, hey, Russell, you missed the point on that or think about it this way. Uh, I, I've known a lot a of people resource. in my life who who thought their superpower was giving advice. Uh, so that's a refreshing <laughs> change. Yeah. But yeah, I'll mention we're getting really close to a thousand total listens across the whole podcast. Uh, we're averaging, for those who are curious, we're averaging around 75 unique listeners uh, for every episode. Uh, some of our episodes are approaching or have exceeded over a hundred listens. So yeah, there's, uh, you know... We don't get to hear back from you uh, as as the listener very often. So if if you're hearing this and you like what you hear, we'd love just just a, a note or a tweet or an email. If if you're getting value out of this, our goal is to provide value for our listeners. So we'd love to know uh, what you're getting a lot out of, what's not so great, uh, you know, anything at all. So that'll wrap it up for today. Thanks everyone for listening, and we will see you next time. 